was floating around. And uh, so it did have that precedent. It wasn't totally unprecedented. Um, but it wasn't a particular illustration of a particular myth. And that's what uh, sort of, and this is the Victorian age. We're in 1863. We've mo we're moving into the Victorian age. There's a new kind of uh, repressiveness and uncomfortableness uh, that's beginning to settle into civilization regarding sexuality in the body. Now we move on to Cezanne, who responds to Manet with this. He says that this is his luncheon on the grass. And uh, now he's got the three figures sort of bring back the mythological reference to the three graces. So now it's okay, we've got three graces. It's okay to represent the three negative. Um, and uh, this is uh, Cezanne himself, represented, he's sort of musing. There's his friend probably drawing a sketchbook. This guy's getting ready to take a sail on the boat on the lake. And then the important thing, though, about this painting is that, um, and I didn't bring the, dra the diagram of it, which I should have, is that later on, a scholar in the 20th century, a woman analyzed his, all of Cezanne's paintings, and what she found was that um, he painted on curved, not literally on curved surfaces, but he painted with curved geometry. So that if you look at all, um, instead of having these rectilinear vanishing points and sharp angular curves, as we've had in all these other paintings, or rather angular you know, angles, not curves, Cezanne painted the world in terms of curves, and it's literally a curved space. This is sort of curved over here, and you've got this wavy undulation over here, and um, Gebser's going to say that the important thing about the aperspectival slash integral consciousness structure is that its primary geometrical symbol is the sphere. And non-Euclidean geometry, remember, was being discovered at the turn of the 19th century, and it was discovered um, independently by four or five different mathematicians. Um, and all of non-Euclidean, the majority of non-Euclidean geometry anyway, is based on curved space. If you take a sort of, you know, and you, you can say laws are absolute, and if you, take, you draw a triangle and you say the, three, the sum of the three angles of the triangle add up to um, 180 degrees, and that's true forever. Well, what these guys did was they said, let's put that triangle on a curved surface, then add up the angles. They don't add up anymore. The angles have been changed by being placed on a curved surface. Uh, and the way in which you change the curvature, if you change it to convex, you can, uh, you know, you can amp you can play around with that. So, and that was, of course, the forerunner of Einstein's vision of gravitation now as curved space. So there's a spirit moving through Faustian culture that begins with the discovery of, of non-Euclidean geometry, moves through the painting, and then ends up in science. Science usually catches on last to what is being discovered in art first. And then uh, Cezanne is, of course, the master of the still life. And um, this is a completely a perspectival painting. These pots are represented as though you were looking at them from simultaneously from down and also from directly on this way. Um, same thing with this plate. You're looking at it from above at the same time as you're looking at it from profile. So nothing is correct perspectively there. The table, everything looks as if it's about to slide off of the table because there is no horizontal thrust uh, where the table should be. So he is consciously violating the laws of perspective. It's not the same thing in the unperspectival consciousness structure where people didn't know about perspective. They didn't know how to represent things correct in correct perspective. Here they know how to do perspective and that now they're moving on and violating it deliberately because a new consciousness structure is coming in, Gebser will say, and is unconsciously sort of causing them to do this and um, to depart from this tradition. So Spangler sees all this as a departure from tradition and Gebser sees it as a departure from tradition because it's establishing a new tradition. And um, Cezanne's uh, Bathers is another important, um, he's got a whole series of these paintings. He had an obsessive mind and so he really only has three subjects, the still life, the bathers and the mountain, and he paints, you know, like 50 paintings of each of those subjects. He was very obsessive. Um, but this painting I throw in here is the transition to Picasso because um, this character, this figure here, and this figure here, keep your eye on them because now they appear in the painting that established modern art. And this is Demoiselle d'Avignon, and uh, there she is. Correct. Here she is, sitting down, and here is the central figure. And um, this figure is simultaneously represented from looking at her from behind and also looking at her face directly from in front. 
So she's completely torqued. And um, you have this total thrust of total aperspectivity here. Now lots of people say that this was inspired by uh, Picasso's study of African art. And in particular these two here are look like as though they were based on uh, African masks. And in fact they may be. There was an exhibition of African art in uh, the Museum of France. Um, but the thing is that even were that, even if that's the case, the African art structure, as we'll see, exists within a totally different consciousness structure, the magical consciousness structure. It doesn't have this sense of aperspectivity in it, and we'll see why in a moment. But this is the, the beginnings of modern art, 1907, really. Um, and he, after he painted this, um, he was so upset with it that he kept it, uh, I believe, for like 10 years and never showed it to anyone for about 10 years. And so uh, in James Cameron's movie, The Titanic, he makes the mistake of having his character, because that took place in 1912, and this has been painted in 1907. That, uh, the lead character is, has a sort of copy of this in her uh, cabin, but it wouldn't have been available to the public until about uh, 19, uh, 1917. And uh, here's Picasso's famous way of representing a human portrait simultaneously in profile and directly in full face. And so what you're getting there, the important thing to understand about the aperspectival consciousness structure is that now you have the eruption of time. Time is a dimension that isn't included in the perspectival three-dimensional consciousness structure. You've got three-dimensional space and um, you've got this sort of slicing up of time into these three segments, past, present, future. Time in the, in the perspectival consciousness structure, everything, I should say, rather, is drawn out in terms of a triangle. And um, with the eruption of time into art, you began to get this idea that if the person was sitting and I walked around the person and looked, as I was walking around the person, the time that it would take me to walk around the person, I would get all these different angles of the person. But here, they're being, the different angles are being represented at the same time, and so you get the sense of simultaneity of time and the eruption of time. And um, that's sort of uh, that painting. And then here's one of my favorites in the last of our series. Just because you get this interesting angle of this woman. This woman in profile right here. And then also in profile from that angle. So you can have these colliding profiles. So uh, <clears throat> that's how Gebser begins uh, his book, by looking at these um, two different uh, moments where we have the mutation from the unperspectival to the perspectival and then the uh, perspectival to the aperspectival. So now why don't we take a little break uh, for a few minutes and uh, digest that and then we'll come back and go into Gebser's consciousness structures. So before we get back into uh, Gebser too far, I just want to draw a couple of equivalences so that you know that um, we're just sort of playing the role of the blind man and the elephant with all of these guys. No, one, no single one of them has a complete, not even Steiner, and Steiner probably was the closest, a complete picture of, of reality and the way it works. I don't think such a thing is possible. Reality is far too richer than can ever be uh, captured in anybody's conceptual system. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I wanted to expose you to these different points of view with regard to the same idea of the evolution of consciousness so that you don't get uh, stuck in any one of them and think that that's, you know, that's how it is because Gebser says there are only five structures and so that's it. But I want you to get a sense of, well, Gebser says there are five structures, but Spangler denies that there was an evolution of consciousness so that you can have these different points of view to play around with for yourself and sort of make up your own mind about you know, what you want to believe with respect to each one of these. Um, but just with respect to the mythical consciousness structure is what we're dealing with. Spangler uh, begins right there in the mythical consciousness structure with the Sumero-Babylonian culture and the Egyptian and probably also you would say the Indian, Chinese, and the Mexican 